Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, what is solutions focused coaching and how could it drive down exclusions? And I'm in conversation with Jeff James. Okay, well, my name's uh, Jeff James. I'm Dr. Jeff James and a little bit about me. Um, um, about, I mean, about this conversation, I suppose, I, when I was in my mid forties, I did a teaching qualification and, um, and went to work. The job I got was um, in a special school. You know, very long. I lived in West Wales then in a, in a sort of beautiful mountains and I moved all the way across to Norfolk, which is a very different place to look at um, because that's where the job was. And I, I worked in a special school for just over two years and then um, moved from there to work for local authority for educational psychology service as a behaviour support teacher and um, teaching in a pupil referral unit, science teaching. So I trained as a secondary science teacher <clears throat> through the medium of Welsh, which I'd learned when uh, living in West Wales. And, um, and before that, I was, my first degree was in zoology and botany, and I'd done research in that area and uh, ran a fish farm for a while. It was to do with the research I'd done. And, uh, and then had a bit of a change and uh, repaired smashed cars for a while and then had another bit of a change and uh, my first child was born in 1980 and um, I was put out of work at about the same time so I stayed at home with him and my then wife went back to went back to work and uh, <clears throat> I was free I felt a bit sort of I was a bit isolated really because there weren't many dads at home with babies at that time and things like you know wherever you went there were never changing facilities for a man to use because they're always in the women's toilets you know so so that you know I was sort of, sort of a bit on the edge really so I uh, got I, um, my, my son I put my son into a nursery a bit and I got a job as a volunteer with a scheme called On The Move which was adult literacy um, you know sort of scheme <clears throat> government scheme and I imagine that where I lived in Chelmsford in Essex it was very high employment and some big companies working there uh, Marconi and a ball bearing factory and you know big employees I wouldn't I imagine there wouldn't be anybody coming to adult literacy classes and when I got there it was just full up there were just so many people coming along who who just had somehow missed out and you know their literacy skills weren't what they wanted and particularly um fairly young mothers who uh, got children in school and couldn't help them much because they you know they couldn't manage the literacy demand and then I qualified I did a qualif RSA qualification that and then worked as a tutor uh, with a and I got a def I think I was the first person in Essex to be paid by the educational authority to do um, to run a, a course for adults with learning disabilities who were all going to a day centre at that time in Billericay in Essex, and uh, and that was that was just so interesting, such an interesting experience of people who'd had, I mean, really their life experience was so limited because, you know, the, in the people I worked with, they largely lived at home with ageing parents and went to a day centre during the day, and that was about it really. So um, <clears throat> I sort of, uh, what the difficulty was, they had nothing to talk about really because they didn't do much. So we started walking out and about around, around the place, around the town, and looking in gardens and finding things to talk about. And then it kind of struck me that that was a good idea. So I, start in, I moved to Wales with my then wife. Oh. Uh, and um, set up uh, an outdoor um, facility, out, sort of outdoor learning uh, for adults with learning disabilities. <coughs> And uh, so they came along for a week and then we did, uh, well, they kept a diary during the week and the idea was they could take that back to wherever they were, you know, living and uh, spending their days then. Uh, and they would have some experiences to talk about in literacy work they were doing wherever they were. And that was, that was very successful. That was terrific, a few years doing that. And, uh, and then that sort of fizzled out largely because there's changing government policy and adults with disabilities weren't funded for any kind of recreational thing. It had to be put in terms of training. And what I did was not, I, didn't, wouldn't, I wouldn't put it as training because it was, it was bigger than that really. It was just about being out and about and going to places that 
like anybody else might go to and they've been you know had limited access to and uh, and that's how i came i was then we had a little uh, small, uh, self-sufficient farm that i was running then and that's how that work ran out so then i went to train at avarice with as a teacher using my degree that i'd done all those years before and uh, and set off on that path and then while i was doing the work in the special school what struck me was i had no training to to work with children who had emotional behavior difficulties which were all the children in that school they were all statemented as it was called then you know for that yeah. and so i was a scientist and a trained science teacher but i didn't have training in that so i asked the, the rest of the staff in this private privately run school what their training was and nobody had any people just came and did the job without any training which was kind of surprising because it's a you know these are children with particular needs of all kinds you know not just what was written on the statement but for what was underlying the reason that they you know weren't managing a mainstream school or where they came from so um i started i looked for reading and there wasn't any really i found one book that was any that was about that working with children with those kind of needs but didn't give you any idea how to do it so i started an ma i did an open university ma that was uh, three years you know one module a year which i finished at just about the same time i moved to local authority and i started a phd just before i finished my ma which took me eight years and in the course of that came to something which is the subject of what we're going to talk about today i guess which is um i started in 98 my phd in 2001 uh, somebody came along called Harvey Ratner from an organisation called Brief in London who brought solution focused brief therapy to the UK from America uh, in the 80s and uh, he did there was a one day training session on solution focused brief therapy and I had a referral of a boy um, to do some work with and on the referral information um it said that he'd experienced a highly traumatic event when he was six and um which wasn't resolved he was offered he had actually witnessed a murder in his house wow. and of a, of a young family friend <clears throat> and he was offered um but tads was to be offered support by cams of some kind but it never happened so that he was 10 when i you know had the referral to work with him and his behavior was very difficult to manage. He was fighting a lot outside and, mm -hmm. and that was put down, you know, it was kind of implied this was to do with this trauma he'd experienced. And I wasn't prepared to just go and start work with him and re-raise this, you know, unresolved trauma. I had to have a safe way of working. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, stall, I was stalling a referral and under pressure from the Ed Psych who'd referred it to me, you know, sort of get on with it kind of thing. And then Harvey came along with his one day training and I realized that was it because solution of focus brief therapy is a fail safe in the sense that you don't explore trauma, that you're looking for what works and you're not looking, you're not interested particularly in what doesn't work. So, so I bought um, a book that I had on my knee and a notebook, met this boy and his mum and six weeks later he was back out in the playground playing football all the threat of permanent exclusion had disappeared uh, so he was right on the edge of being permanently excluded it was like like one more one more event you know and he'd go and um he moved up to high school and disappeared amongst the thousand other children in high school so, so that tell us <laughs> more about him and how so you did one day of training and then you had this approach that you felt comfortable using with him and in six weeks it made a difference what did that yeah. look like in practice well it, it was so uh, in the, on the training day, I mean, Harvey, you, you can't do a lot in one day, really, no. with a group of, um, I don't know, 40 people in a, in a village hall and the WI making sandwiches at lunch. You know, it wasn't, it's sort of, it wasn't intense. But in the afternoon, he, Harvey was doing something and then he invited us to ask a solution focused question. So I'm the sort of person that tends to put my hand up every time and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I could have a go at that. So I asked the question and Harvey said, He's the most gentle man. And um, he said, well, yes, you could, you could ask that, or maybe you could. And then he asked, what was the solution focused question? So that made me think, wow, there's more to this than, you know, it's not just being positive. There's more to this, the, the sort of deep structure of it. So because I was doing a PhD at the time, I was doing a lot of reading. So I've left that training 
and then found everything I could to read about it. And then I bought a book which was actually written by one of the, his um, team in the team he worked with in Brief in London called Yasmin Ajmal, who's Ed Psych, educational psychologist. And her book was enough of a clear explanation that I, in terms of the practicality of it, that I, I read her book and that, that's the book I had in front of me. And I made some notes for myself in a reported notebook down the side about what these elements of the practice were and then set off. I mean, not, not, you know, not feeling like I was an expert solution focused brief therapist, but that I could meet the demand of this assessment, this um, referral I had, and I could do something which was going to be safe because at worst it would be a conversation just to chat about stuff he liked doing. And at best it could make a real change because of what's in the, in the, this way of working, you know, like that. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, as it was going on, you know, I, I, I remember writing comments to myself after the first session because I've missed a couple of things out. You know, if, if I was to do this as a, like a script mm. and I made a note to myself, you know, I won't tell you what I wrote, but it was a personal comment to myself mm -hmm. about how I've missed it. When I came to the second session, what I could realise was it didn't matter because all the all the, this way of working is all about description. It's a particular kind of description. So that if you miss one particular, um, you know, questioning style, if you like, to be able to get to develop the description, it'll be in somewhere else. So, you know, it kind of, it's kind of, kind of, um, it's kind to the, to the solution focused brief therapist, as well as to the client, if you like, you know, it's both, it's very, very forgiving. And what, what, and also because I was working, my, my, um, PhD was about education. I'm rooted in education. So it was its core. My thesis title was called Finding a Pedagogy. Because what I was after was a pedagogical way of working with children who are, you know, sort of entitled having emotional behavioral difficulties. And I not which was not going to be a medical or or fully psychological, but a proper, you know, from my point of view, educational way. And this approach is um, is inquiry. It's called inquiry pedagogy so that the teacher and the taught are co-constructing the learning that's okay so that in in the doing of that it means what it means is that as the therapist you don't have to have expertise on a lot of areas about disorder okay what you need to have is is you need to know about what inquiry pedagogy is and you need to know what the process of solution focused working is like that and what are the kind of the, the key elements of that practice? I mean, what does that look like? What would you, you teach someone if they wanted to know the basics? Yeah, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm in the middle of doing, I'm just, in, I'm just putting the last touches together on an online course I'm doing, uh, offering. Um, and it, it's, I've, the way I present it is slightly, it's a little bit different to solution focused brief therapy in a clinical setting. And for a while, when I worked for a local authority, I was seconded to CAMS for four years. So I've worked with, like in both areas, really, education and um, mental health. And um, I've sort of, over the time, I've tried to slim it down and slim it down and make it simpler yeah. so that for school staff to learn it. So this is about increasing capacity in school. So school staff can learn how to do this with a fairly, with a brief course um, by having it clearly seeing what the structure is and then once you get the shift in thinking then the structure is just something you can provide like I did with that very first person boy I work with so the the you know what it's made up of really is the key features of it is one thing is about power balance so that as the adult working with a child I'm not taking control I'm doing everything I can to to maintain the the agency of the child, the child's ability to, you know, be part of this inquiry that we're doing. So that I'm not being a directive teacher where I know more and I'll deliver it. I'm asking open questions. So there's questions you can't answer yes or no to. And um, from the very from the very start of it, um, I'm approaching the conversation by knowing something about the other person that directs my directs my thinking. So the way that I present that is that I know so for example if I was working with you and you were the client and I was a solution focused coach I know that you are successful 
hopeful and resourceful. So that I keep those three things in mind so that if there's anything which starts to push me a bit to look like you are not successful, hopeful, resourceful, I can remember that, just slow down and just go back to being that as being that being the sort of basis of the conversation. And I think, well, one, I mean, one thing that's come up with this, you know, thinking about this work for so long and doing it for so long, it was 2001 that I first came across it, is that um, this idea about, about, you know, a blink of an eye communication between people before you say anything, you know, the, the sort of, you know, the gut reaction type vagal, you know, system, is that um, if you approach somebody knowing that they are successful, hopeful and resourceful, that you make a different contact with the, the other person than if you know that they're in deficit. I see. And, and, uh, and there's good, you know, that as you'll know, there's good science behind this. You can see, you know, like, um, like um, Dynamon's thinking fast and slow idea, you know, that, the, that the, fast, the fast part is unconscious and out of control and rough and important. And the slow part is, is, you know, you think it and it's more accurate and you have time to reflect. So that before even the conversation starts, I'm doing something which sets it up in a way that's going to make it go in a particular direction towards strengths and then away from deficits. So, so the first thing is to be approaching the conversation to knowing that you can't do any harm, that the other person is successful, hopeful, resourceful, and that whatever you do will have a, will have a useful outcome. So that so that you cut like in a way you can't fail at it, and that you've got the right pe people in the room and the right amount of time. So I'm not under pressure from anything really. And then to start it off with this idea of power balance, the first thing I say is, um, "What's your best hope for this meeting?" So we've got half an hour to have a conversation. So supposing it was useful to you, and it has to be useful, otherwise there's no point in us sitting here and talking to each other. So supposing it's useful to you what would that be about what would we talk about that could be useful to you and um and it looks like as a pretty that's a pretty high powered question but i worked over time i worked with children down the youngest children sort of in you know working individually were five and they'll respond to that in the same way but obviously your language changes a bit and you you present it in a way that a five-year-old can get hold of it you know better than a 14 year old might if you just said what's your best hope for this half hour kind of thing yeah. And in fact, with older students, I mean, just recently I've done some work with two 15 year old girls and they were very reluctant to come along at all. So they were, in fact, one of them didn't come in the morning and then came later on in the day. So the first thing I said to her was, have you got any idea what this is about? And she said, no. And I said, well, I haven't either. So how about if we'll first thing we'll do is try and find out what it could be about. And in terms of, if you think of that from her perspective, in terms of power balance, then I'm not Dr. Jeffrey James, you know, with a white coat going to ask you something which is going to make you feel difficult. I'm saying, well, I haven't got a clue what this is about either. So let's try and find out, shall we? And that was, it was just, that was a really productive way of starting because we were, we were straight into an inquiry where, where you know, the student had a, had a voice and I did like that. What kind of, you know, response do you tend to get to that question? You know, what, what would you hope to happen in this half hour well, you, well, you, yeah the usual response uh, have you got something in mind when you ask that or not or was that a, was that an open question no it's an open question okay because well i ask you that because it seems like you know if you've got a fairly reluctant 15 year old who's been taken away from something else to it and you said you know you asked any question really the pretty good chance they're going to say i don't know isn't there it's a pretty good chance is yeah. i don't know you know, like, well, a weird question. How should I know that? I don't know. And that's that's very often what you get back. One, so one important thing, reason for remembering that person is successful, hopeful or resourceful is that that is the best answer they could give. So in, in, in saying to me, I don't know, they're telling me something important in the best way that they can. So I treat that exactly as it's said. So I, so I might say, well, that's a really, that's a really, that answer, that's really useful to me, that answer, because it means I need to ask you a different question, okay? So, so you don't, when I asked you, you know, like, what could this be about? And you said, I don't know. So I suppose I asked you, it, I'll put it a little bit differently. Um, like, um, so supposing you just had a little, a really slightest vague idea what it might be about. 
you know, like the like a you know, just a vague idea. Uh, you know, what might that be? Just like a vague idea how this could be useful. If it was just a little bit useful to you, what could that be about? And that because I've shrunk it so much. And again, the powers the powers balanced in the room, isn't it? I'm not. I, I'm saying I don't know what the answer is to this, and I asked you the wrong question, so I'm going to ask you a different one. And you, and that will usually you'll get some kind of answer, like it'll be like because mm, it'll be it, that, of course there'll be a re like, by, like my behaviour, or you know, or one fifteen year old girl said to me, "Be naughty," which was a surprising way to put it for a you know young woman really, but mm -hmm. that's what she said. And then. Okay, so supposing it's something about that. So supposing they said my behaviour. I said, so supposing we did some work around that that was a bit useful to you in the next half an hour. Shall we? We'll go ahead and do that, shall we? And then they'll go, yeah, okay. And then that's it. I'm not going to ask any more about the project. But mm -hmm. what it's done is it's given us a clear, like a project, a reason for having that meeting at all. It's about my behaviour. So now the difference is in solution focused working, and then I'm not going to explore that at all, what it means. I'm going to ask a different question is which is called problem free talk and it's what's your best thing what do you like doing best and what comes out of that is that the the person I'm talking to will start to talk about something in the world where they've got some kind of mastery and it doesn't matter what it is or how small it is or how big it is or so um and when they're doing that you know when you when you speak about yourself in those kind of terms about having mastery then do you know about flow you know about flow state well my i wrote a book in 2016 about solution focused um, approach and that was one thing i explored in in the book was that when you start to flow is a, is a, is the feeling you get when you're really if you're really good at something and you begin to do it you know it's going to work without knowing how it's going to work so if you're really good at riding a bike without falling off it you'll jump on your bike and you go whizzing around and you'll never think whether you'll fall off or not. What you do is you experience the pleasure of being a really good bike rider or a really good at playing the piano or really good at, I mean, this, the girl I told you about who said being naughty was her project. When I asked her that question, what's your best thing? What do you like doing? She said, um, she said mashed potato. So I said, oh, okay, tell me more about mashed potato. Now this was a she was she was wearing light makeup, very well presented. She was this was a school that I was doing a one day piece of one afternoon piece of work in, no one day piece of work in, and the school said they found me the most disengaged student they got. It was a secondary school in a in an area where they have grammar and secondary schools, so she was very reluctant to turn up to start with, and then she you know she did come in, and then so and she said mashed potato. So, okay, tell me more about mashed potato. And she talked about mashed potato for about a quarter of an hour. We had half an hour for the meeting. And she told me, you know, like, okay, tell me a bit more about that. How come you do that? Well, she, well, she, you know, she told me that she kept at it till there were no lumps. Okay, so, so how do you know when it's done? Well, mum says, oh, that's looking really good. Okay, so what's your mum seeing in you that makes you a really good mashed potato maker? Well, and she's saying things like, well, I don't give up. I keep on till it's done. And as she's talking, she's talking, she's talking faster and louder and because she's in flow, she's experiencing flow as a mashed potato maker. And I know that she'd never been asked about that before in her life. Who would ever have asked her about that before? <laughs> life, would, they? would they? Particularly somebody, you know, Dr. Jeff James coming in from somewhere to do some training in the school about behavior management or whatever you call it, you know, like that. Anyway, so she told, she told me all about that. What I'm doing is, I'm listening to her story and then not, not offering much apart from another, okay, how come you do that? Or tell me a bit more about that. Or, oh, wow, so who would notice that? And what would your mum say if? So these are just kind of triggering inquiry questions, really, like that. Yeah. And then uh, when, that, when she finished that, I said she wasn't ready. She was, she was in such a, you know, energized state really talking about it i said okay so that was mashed potatoes tell me something else that you like doing and she said she had a little thing and she said lasagna oh lasagna so she did she, she did about nearly 10 minutes talking about lasagna how you have to you know how you have to do that have to layer it properly and how you have to and the same thing so what is it about you that you you know you can do that so what's happening is she's getting talked about strengths that she's got 
which she never knew particularly that she'd had or never verbalized anyway. Mm. And she can hear in her own ears, her saying, well, I suppose um, I stick at it, I suppose. I'm persistent. Oh, right. You think how that translates into what was happening for her in school, the most disengaged student they got, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, an, in another setting. But of course, the important thing is that when she's making mashed potatoes, she's the same person as when she's in a maths class looking out the window. The same person with the same strengths. So the same potential for, um, you know, persistence in one thing as another. Anyway, we nearly ran out of time. So we very quickly rounded the meeting up and uh, and did the things which finish which are more of this elements of work the seven elements and you can you can tick them off if that's what you're going to be doing and um so i did some more work in the school the reason i did the work with her i wanted to demonstrate to her her, her head of year who've been in touch with me about how this work works so by seeing it she was sitting in the room by seeing it happening that was a way of showing her and then we met with the other heads of year and then with the whole school and um a week later, I had an email from the, this head of year to say that she'd arranged a meeting with this girl as a follow up and the girl hadn't turned up. So that was oh, OK. So, I, so do you know, you know anything about that? Well, she already had an appointment with a you know, some, you know, counselor or something like that, you know, to help her. <coughs> she came the next day. Anyway, I had another email from this head of year and she said the head of year said, well, I don't know what's happened, but I've had I'm having teachers talking to me about this girl and she's doing better in class, she's getting her work done, she's paying attention. And that was after one 30 minute session. And I've seen that happen repeatedly over 20 years. And in that conversation, so the, the mashed potato and the lasagna, and obviously you yeah. talked a bit about how you reflect back on the, um, the, the strengths and the skills or you're encouraging her to reflect yeah. back on those. Do you do more? Is there any more directive part of that practice or you give her stuff to go away and do or it's, literally yeah. as it sounds yeah i, I, I can I quickly i mean i can't teach you how to do this in 10 minutes but you know <laughs> quickly run through the structure is so there's the setting the project there's problem free talk there's something called exception finding which is sometimes people will talk about a problem in the past and because this is a very respectful way of working as all psychotherapy should be then um then i'm not going to stop the person talking about that but what i'm going to do is wait for a little gap and then I'm going to say, I'm going to acknowledge the difficulty. So I'm going to say something like, well, it seems to me like when that was happening to you, it was a really difficult time. And I'm interested that even though it was so difficult for you, somehow you've come through it and you're here today and you're telling me about that. And that's what I'm hearing. Something about you that you could cope with that somehow and keep going. Is that true about you? So acknowledging is a way of, of bringing the problem sort of into the room and returning to being solution focused strength focused rather than going to explore the problem where the deficits might lie yeah. so that's an, an element another one is um, what will come after the uh, mashed potato could be scaling and solution focused scaling isn't about numbers to to try to move somebody so if somebody's at an eight i wouldn't say so what will you do to be at a 10 in a week's time it's more better if somebody was at a three I wouldn't say, so what would you do to be eight in a week's time? I'd say, so how come you're at three and not at one? In other words, what's already working, mm -hmm. what's already going well, that you're already at three. And that when I've worked with particularly a couple of times, I, one, I remember working with a mother and a 13 year old. And the mother thought that was a revelation because she'd never heard anybody talk about that bit. She'd only ever heard talk about the bit from three to 10, mm -hmm. which, which wasn't present and not talk about the bit which is already present. And that, that makes a, in terms of self-esteem of the person you're talking to, that gives them a different view of what the world's like because they've already got, so if a person was at three, I'd say, what I can see is you're already sort of well on, you're part of the way up the scale, getting all the way up to 10, where things will be going, you know, okay for you. So how come you're doing that? What is it about you that you can do that? And then, so the next part that comes within scaling is to say, OK, so supposing we were to talk in a week's time, where do you hope you might be with that three? Do you hope that might change, stay where it is? What are you hoping about that? And then so this is about hope, not about fixed, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I hope it might be at four next week. All right. So supposing that happens, supposing it was next week and we were talking to each other and it was at four. 
why what might be a bit different what might you know you might be doing something a bit differently what might that be so then they're talking about the plan that gets them from where they are to getting towards their 10 on the scale or nine or wherever's their high point on the scale and then and that's so that's scaling and then um and then what i do with that is to say um is to give a task at the end of the session which is the task is to look out for what's going well so i'm going to ask you between now and next week you look out for what's going well notice what's going well and then i'm going to ask you about that so that's such a wide question it's not saying notice you doing that particular thing you've talked about but notice what's going well because that will incorporate that and also anything else that's around and then and that's and this compliments then compliments are a part of it so that at the end of a meeting i would always do compliments which is supposing there were three people in the room like a mum, a child and me and i'd say so there's going to be three compliments to you one is going to be you to yourself yeah. one's going to be your mum to you or one is going to be me to you so remembering the power thing then i'll say so who would you like to go first and that'll be oh well i don't mind i say and i'll say well i don't mind either so you decide who would go first and then it'll be they'll choose and very often i find very often it's the first the child has had really no practice at self-complimenting particularly children who get in a very difficult place you would have noticed seen the same thing that they that they're not used to saying to themselves yeah i'm okay at that yeah I'm, that's something strong about me so often the first time it takes a little bit of time for them to get near enough to be able to so they might ask mum to go first and she'll say well i've noticed that in this meeting you've just been talking an awful lot you know you've been talking and being clear and then that'll give them a little clue so then they might say yeah well i think well mum said about my talking i think i might say the same thing I think I've been talking really well and then I'll say whatever my contribution is and that so then if we have another meeting that's going to get into a routine then so we're going to finish with compliment and and uh, task and in solution focused complimenting it's very different to praise because my how I, I see praise as being one per, one person giving an opinion about another person so in my opinion Pookie, you know, you've been doing a good job here because you let me talk nearly entirely all the time and you haven't said very much. Well, that's my opinion of you. But if I was to say to you, it seems to me like something about you is that you're able to just sit back and let the conversation flow. Is that true about you that you can do that? And then you're nodding your head. So, you know, you're confirming it. And that's, that's, that's not my opinion of you. That's me kind of summing up my thoughts about it and then offering it to you and then you can confirm it or you might say that's not true at all i've been feeling really impatient but i've been you know i've just been controlling myself also something you can control yourself in a tight situation to be able to do that yeah yes yeah, like that you know so it's a very there's a lot of um this it's a it's a even balanced conversation all the way through from the beginning to the end it feels like curiosity is quite an important kind of element here like you're having to do quite a lot of reflecting and teasing out of, of different things and trying to find things right. out that perhaps haven't been asked before mm -hmm. of a child that is a terrific bit of noticing Pookie <laughs> because <laughs> you know what I'd say you know like like people like you know when I'm doing the like the training or the course what well, is about so how do you know one question to the next question and the idea is you can't know your question until you've heard the answer to the previous one and when you when you've heard that your curiosity will lead you to the next question and you can't know it so it means you're sitting there just waiting paying attention to what the person's saying and then listening to what they've said and then formulating your next question from that so curiosity is what leads the whole conversation so two you know like two solution focused coaches will have a different conversation at each point because their their, their curiosity would lead them in a different place but the directions are always the same because overall i'm curious about what your strengths are what your qualities resources and strengths are and your hopes and like that you know your hopes and your strengths and and your successes so hopeful resourceful hopeful successful that's sort of embedded in it all the time like that and i'm interested to know how this works when you've got children who have 
you talked a bit there about how sometimes they find it hard to see their strengths because the kinds of kids that I've got in mind are maybe children who are really used to hearing about their challenges and their difficulties and their yeah. failings and they might readily list those um, and the, the idea of engaging with them in this kind of really curious conversation focused yeah. on their strengths um, it, I don't, it, it sounds unlikely you know how, how do you make that work? It does, it does sound really unlikely and I think um, I think how you make it work is by a sort of having a bit of understanding of what's going on underneath it because if, you, if a person's got a habitual way of thinking so if they tend to think about themselves as being in trouble and a failure and they're dominated by a problem if you open that up if you open up that that neural net that, that way of thinking then that will that'll be very strong and it'll come in strongly so that so that all the time you're doing this work, you're being you're being careful that you don't do that, even to the point of when that when it does start to open up, and the person starts to talk about it. The acknowledgement idea is that you can return it to being strength focused, and close that 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 net down very quickly by asking a strength focused problem. So that and and I mean I have to say when I started off doing this, I was like you, I thought this is never going to work because I was only ever had referrals from children who everybody else had tried everything else. Yeah. I mean, including when I was working for the mental health in the mental health clinic, you know, there were, there were, um, there were medics who'd prescribed medication and there could be other people doing other types of um, talking work, but nobody was doing the work that I was doing mm -hmm. and they were getting people getting stuck. So that it's like, it's a big challenge really as to whether you can make this work or not. And you think, well, why should this work when something doesn't? And it's because that an awful lot of the rest of the kind of helping work returns to the problem. And once you're in the problem field, that tends, because it's a habit of, you know, thinking, that will tend to dominate the whole conversation. And because of what goes with it. So when a child's talking about failure, they won't be feeling a high level of self-esteem and they might well tend to close down. Yeah. So then you get stuck because they won't talk to you because they're sitting in the chair with their head down and having heard this before, probably not feeling good about themselves and not having anything to talk about, really, that doesn't make them feel bad. Whereas as soon as the 15 year old started talking about mashed potato, she was energized into talking more about it. And it, and it was I mean, it was odd because she didn't, you know, she didn't say, why are we talking about that? You know, she didn't. Well, what a weird conversation to have. You know, what are you on? Why are we talking about mashed potato? <laughs> <coughs> because to her, this was her. The little bit of the world where she was a star yeah so so that's why it does it does seem unlikely and it gets sometimes solution focused brief therapy and solution focused coaching get represented as just a positive conversation but if you were tried to have a just a positive conversation without the understanding and the and the and the structure then it would it would probably land back in the problem because the problem will keep popping itself up I so, that, so that I mean, your like in your work, you do my work that I do. As I walk into the room, and the child walks into the room, they know what's going to come next, don't they? Because mm -hmm. they've done this before. We we rarely meet children at the very first stage, do we? Yeah. You know, in the in the preventative line, we're meeting them later on. So they're they're beginning the conversation, knowing this is going to be what's gone before. It's when I something or other, when I threw that person over the school fence, and they hit their head on the ground you know it's going to be that one and so that because they've got that in mind they're, they're going to be in that state where they're not feeling good about themselves something like that which because I had in my head a question around you know how much of this is about the approach and how much of it is about the fact that you've built that kind of safe space where you really hear a child and it sounds like that skill in the approach is actually really important which brings me to a kind of I suppose sort of final question really for you which yeah. is around do people need to be you know trained very clearly trained practitioners to be able to do this kind of work and have these kinds of conversations because I think you, you mentioned in our um sort of chat beforehand about um this fear that sometimes we have in education that we're not trained therapists and we're expecting to do that role right I th that's a really good question as well Puki, because I mean you hear that people people say you know, like in education, they say, well, we're not therapists or we're not, not social workers. Well, I don't think that's true. I think that I think that people working with other people are always therapists in the sense of. But if you take it as therapy being, you know, a trained approach where you're going to explore the history of a problem, then we're certainly not therapists in that sense. But in terms of working in the moment, 
with people who have needs, then children in schools have needs all the time. All staff in school are dealing with children in need all the time. And they're not necessarily doing it by just giving an instruction. They're doing it by relationship. And if it's through relationship, then that's therapy. I mean, you know, psychotherapy has got three parts of effectiveness, really, which is relationship, specific approach and other factors which are unknown. Well, relationship, the third of it, relationship is a big part of education. And, and so, you know, that, so I, I, my, I contend that, that, that it's, not, it's not alien to, to teachers to be therapists, but it is alien if they have to think of themselves as like a psychoanalyst with a couch, something like that. In terms of training, <clears throat> because um, it, it, needs, it needs enough, enough explanation to get the mindset shift. So like the mindset is, when you see something go wrong, when a child approaches you and something's gone wrong, your question is not what's gone wrong, but what's gone right. So you're going to ask this question, what's gone right? In other words, what's working? What's just been going well for you? That's counterintuitive to the way most people work most of the time when problems are around. Yeah. But if you get the mindset change, the, the structure, the seven elements come out of it as, to start with pretty scripted because it's a different language. But as soon as you get what the question, what the understanding is, you can start to shape them into your own language. So I've, what I've been doing so far is um, a two day training course. So it's about um, sort of it's seven hours over two days, something like that. Well, two years ago, I, I set up an online course I ran in Australia and the UK to pilot it. And now I'm just setting up a new one here, which is about the same amount of content time. And I've run the um, distance training and that seems to work as well as the um, as the face to face with one proviso, really, that in, in common with um, a, a continuing professional development, you know, as it's changed in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. there's the training element and then there's the follow up and supervision. Yeah. And the follow up and supervision is a crucial part of it. So that after the online course or the on or the face to face, I'll have a Zoom session with people and then we're starting to get some real like inquiry work about what's working. Some people are going slower, some people quicker, some people have got questions about it. And also last year I produced a, a workbook, a quiz called um, Solution Focused Coaching, a workbook for educators. And that's got the structure written into the workbook and also spaces to write notes. Uh -huh. So that when, as they leave the course, they've got the structure, they've got the whole thing written out in a spiral bound workbook you can put on your desk and scribble on it to carry them and then there's this face-to-face -face follow up and that's what makes it work and that's sufficient people can get on and do the work that sounds fantastic so i'll make sure that we link in the show notes to all those the, the various bits that you've uh, you've yeah, mentioned yeah. so, yeah. so I, I always like to end with a kind of a, a closing thought and um, you're welcome to take it where you want. But the thing I'm wondering that I think is really important about your work is that sometimes it seems like you're the person who holds on to hope when maybe everyone else has given up on a child. Um, and I wondered if you had any thoughts around that and reflections for, for those working with. Yeah. With yeah. Yes. I think that's a good way to put it. I think, I think this hopelessness is, is really debilitating isn't it? And I think, you know, but both sides really, like the, like the adult professional and the child can both lose hope after a bit because we've tried everything and nothing seems to work. And that's when what I think is, the, is this step that should be the exclusion comes along when people get hopeless and then, well, we can't do anything else. It's the last resort and you'll have to go. And in my experience is I, I, I don't need to go to that step because by, by keeping hopeful, um, you can be doing something, you know, in the moment that's different. And I, I mean, I'd add to what you said. I think hope's important, but I called, I, I called this. I had somebody came into a session I was doing in Lincolnshire, who's the inclusion officer in Lincolnshire. And she said to the, uh, just, we were just sort of in the process of doing something. And I was saying to the group, um, I call it structured kindness, because like unstructured kindness doesn't really go anywhere. Because if you're just kind of unstructuredly kind to a child who's just beaten somebody up in the playground, it doesn't, it's not productive really. But structured kindness is this, is this solution focused approach. And it's kind in the sense that you're being hopeful about the other person and knowing that they're resourceful and successful in, in me in order to bring it out in them. So I think, I think the hope, the hopeful part and the structure 
the structured kindness aspect of it is really important and when you can see the difference it makes then you can start to think well maybe i can do this maybe it's worth doing this and it doesn't just bounce off against the you know the rhetoric around discipline and you know the exclusion and that kind of thing the ch ch i mean i've worked with children right on the edge of exclusion for 20 years and you know with a little bit of work and a bit of time not necessarily one session but five sessions over a month say or a little bit longer and then by by staff in school this is then the child isn't excluded and they're where they should be with their friends and their peers you know they've made a mistake they learned something they got over it you know those kind of things productive definitely.